Okay, so maybe we could start. We could start. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Antoine Reserba Planté. I'm working at ICFO and the group of Frank Coppens, and I'm going to chair that session. Um, that would be a talk by Xavier Marie on the exciton in transition metal decalcogenide, mono and bilayer. And um, I would like to, to thank Xavier to, to, joining the, to join this conference. He's a currently professor at INSA University in Toulouse in France. And he's also in charge of the laboratory of excellence called NEXT for nano and extreme measurements and theory, which is a cluster of six laboratories in Toulouse that uh, sum up up to uh, 20, uh, 200 permanent researchers. And he has a long experience on ultra fast optics and ultra fast optical spectroscopy of low dimensional system, let's say, and in particular to the material. And his main interest actually is uh, optical spectroscopy in, in semiconductors nanostructures. And that's, uh, that's why we're very happy to have him today. So thanks, Xavier. Uh, I see that the number of, uh, of attendants are, are growing every second. We are now more like about to be 200. And, 13 right now. So, uh, so I, I guess we could start. And uh, yeah, so the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Antoine. And first of all, I really want to thank uh, our colleagues from ICFO for uh, the organization of this uh, online symposium. I think uh, despite all this uh, uh, critical problems with virus worldwide, it's very important to keep links uh, between uh, between us, between researchers, students, and so thank you for your job to organize this uh, this uh, this uh, online uh, event. So as Antoine said, uh, I will speak uh, today about uh, general properties of exciton in uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. The first part uh, we review the, the properties of monolayers. Uh, and then the second part, and it will be a little bit more in line with the, the title of this uh, symposium, I will speak about uh, 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 homo bilayers and uh, what kind of information we can get from optical spectroscopy, uh, what kind of information we can get on the coupling between the, the different electronic coupling between the, the different layers. Uh, so uh, we have been asked by the organizers to have a rather detailed uh, uh, introduction for master and uh, uh, beginning PhD students. So sorry if you are expert, but I will start from uh, from the beginning. Uh, later, I will try to present more recent results. So as as you know, transition metal calcogenides are not new material at all. They they have been uh, studied a long time ago. Uh, including the structural or even optical properties. And it has been known for a long time that MOS2 is an indirect gap semiconductor, as uh, a molybdenite bulk material you can find in mines. And uh, 10 years ago now, there was this very nice work performed particularly in Tony Hines group showing that when you go to monolayer, uh, this uh, MOS2 behaves as a direct gap. So with rather strong luminescence properties, absorption, and then it opens uh, many investigation uh, uh, in this field of 2D semiconductors. So in this talk, I will speak uh, about MX2, uh, uh, transition metal dichalcogenide, TMD, where M is uh, uh, the, the transition metal, molybdenum, tungsten, and X is uh, sulfur, selenium, terium. Uh, in terms of optical gap, basically, as you show here, the different molar layers, the gaps uh, lie in the uh, visible region of the spectrum, typically in the red or, or near infrared. And of course, in the past 10 years, a lot of work has been done in terms of uh, bond structure calculations to get information about the basic, basic properties of these monolayers. So the approaches were basically using tight binding, huge work on ab initio approach on density functional theory, DFT at different level, more advanced level like GW, and also semi-empirical approach such as K.P. So all this uh, uh, bond structure calculation confirmed that indeed you have a direct gap with uh, uh, electron state and all states uh, which coincide in reciprocal space, the minimum energy, but where they lie in the K valley. So if you are used to optoelectronics, uh, three, five semiconductor, two, six semiconductors, it's very different because in this uh, very well-known material for optoelectronics, usually uh, the 
we deal with optical transition with electron hole which lie in the center of the brain, so in gamma. Whereas here, uh, we will deal with optical transition where the electron hole states involved in the optical transition lie at the edges of the brain. So, so this will really change the symmetry and uh, open very interesting, uh, uh, will have very interesting properties. So, of course, during this uh, uh, symposium, you will hear a fantastic talk about this moiré coupled uh, uh, graphene systems. And uh, uh, compared to the keen graphene, this TMD are rather different. As we say, it's a semiconductor, direct gap. And in contrast to graphene, it's not a single atomic thick layer. Basically, it's a layer of transition metal, uh, molybdenum sandwiched between two layers of uh, calcogen sulfur here. If you look at the top view, you recover the hexagonal uh, structure. And because of that, uh, you, you have in the elementary lattice a broken inversion symmetry. And in addition, uh, molybdenum, tungsten, uh, the transition metal is rather heavy. So you will have a, a rather strong effect of spin orbit coupling, which will play a very important role. And uh, the interplay between this broken inversion symmetry and the strong spin orbit coupling uh, 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 will have a strong impact on the bound structure. So it, again, here is a simplified uh, 2D hexagonal, uh, uh, simplified picture of the 2D hexagonal brewing zone, where uh, gamma is, at, is here uh, at the center. And uh, we have here uh, the, the conduction bound and the valence bound at the K valley, as I said previously. And because of the interplay between this broken inversion symmetry and spin orbit coupling, uh, you have this spin splitting in the valence bound between spin down and spin down states of hundreds of millivolt. volt. We'll see later that there is also a smaller spin splitting in the conduction bound, will, which will play an important role on optical properties, uh, but uh, much smaller amplitude, a few tens of millivolt. volt. And again, if you look at the symmetry, uh, the, the two adjacent valleys, uh, K plus and K minus, are linked by time reversal symmetry. So it tells you that the spin splitting in these two adjacent valleys is opposite. Here at the top of the valence bound, you have spin down state. Here at the top of this valence bound, you have spin up state. So this will yield very uh, interesting and unique properties because you have a, a locking between spin and valet, and it has been described a lot in the literature. It will also yield very unique uh, optical selection rules. I will not detail this uh, uh, today. Just again from the beginning, if you have not familiar with optical spectroscopy, uh, uh, you can start with very basic experiment to get information on the bound structure, is you can measure, as it was done uh, 10 years ago, the absorption of the monolayer as a function of the energy of the photon. And you clearly see in the black curve and uh, two resonances, very clear resonance, resonance on the monolayer, which basically correspond to the transition between the top valence bound to the conduction bound and uh, the second valence bound to the uh, conduction bound. So from this splitting, uh, you measure very easily, uh, you can get uh, uh, information about the spin orbit splitting uh, roughly in the valence bound, about 250 millivolt volt. This is for MOS2. If you do the same on WAC2, here typical sample, we, we all investigate, I will call this, uh, this the first generation of sample, basically exfoliated monolayer on the SiO2 silicon substrate. Here, it's not a absorption transmission, it's a reflectivity contrast, the differential reflectivity as a function of the energy. And you clearly see again, very, two very strong resonances associated to the two transition involving the two valence bound I presented. Here, tank 10 WAC2 monorayer, heavier atom, stronger spin orbit splitting, no surprise, the splitting is uh, almost three times larger in WAC2 compared to MOS2. So this is very basic characterization uh, when you can start to have information on, on, on the bond structure. But one very important element uh, we, have, uh, we have to consider is uh, uh, the fact that the electron and hole uh, in this monolayer are strongly bound, forming a very robust exciton. And this very robust exciton in addition to the direct gap, explains the, the very uh, large absorption you get for monolayer. It's really amazing comparing to, compared to other semiconductors that a monolayer less than one nanometer thick K 
can absorb up to 15%, 20% of light. It's really spectacular. And this comes from the fact that you have exciton with a giant binding energy of the order of few hundred, uh, hundreds of millilectron volt, depending on the environment, we will come back to this point. Compared to the uh, model system well known of gallium arsenide quantum well, you, you see it's uh, uh, one or two order of magnitude larger. Even zinc oxide, which is known as a material with very large binding energy of the exciton bulk, uh, you, you, you have here a much larger binding energy. And indeed, because of this exciton features, I will describe a little in, in more detail in a, in a few minutes, you get in an absorption spectrum, this very strong resonance associated to the large oscillator strengths due to this uh, 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 very robust uh, exit. So here is a, is a, is a summary of the, uh, the outline of, of my talk. So in the first part, I will review uh, the main characteristics of, uh, uh, of the uh, exciton in monolayers, transition metal dichalcogen and monolayers, again, binding energy, the key role played by the dielectric environment, the encapsulation, which will, uh, thanks to this, will be able to engineer the exciton, the exciton states, and the consequence of the, the radiative lifetime and also the fine structure. And in the second part of the talk, I will, uh, or final part of the talk, I will speak about how mobile layers in a very modest way compared to uh, many talks which will be presented in this symposium where you will have this very fine tuning of the uh, angle between layers. For us, it will be very simple. Uh, we will just consider a 2H stacking or 3R stacking. So basically, we we'll compare as a coupling uh, of the state between the two layers, or more layer, or more by layers, uh, 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 as a function of uh, zero degree, 180 degree. But anyway, with this, I will show you that we can identify uh, the characteristics of uh, an interlayer exciton. And one we have, once we have identified it, we can uh, uh, control uh, uh, this interlayer exciton by an electric field. And we'll see that we have a very large uh, stack splitting. So, Coming back uh, on the exciton, uh, one of the questions uh, can be why this exciton has, is so robust? Why it has a, such a large binding energy? In fact, with a very simple formula, you can feel this. Uh, 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 if you consider uh, uh, that this exciton are of vanier mott uh, type, and a 2D exciton a binding energy follows this very simple formula, where uh, mu is a reduced mass, which corresponds to the mass of both the conduction bound and valence bound. And at the denominator, uh, the square of the dielectric constant. And it turns out that in these TMD monolayers, both values uh, tend to, uh, to uh, uh, will give you a large binding energy. The reduced mass is very important um, compared to, again, 3, 5, 2, 6 semiconductors. It turns out that the conduction bound mass is rather heavy. At the end of the day, it will give you, at the numerator, a very large value, which will help to get a large binding energy. And more importantly, at the denominator, you have this dielectric constant square. And this dielectric constant will be the key point. It is rather modest. And of course, it depends on the encapsulation environment. But with very uh, early, uh, seven or eight years ago, you could put a reasonable parameter and you end up with this very basic formula of uh, binding energy of a few hundreds of millilectron volt. And of course, uh, to get information on this binding energy, this exciton, it's uh, usually very useful not only to detect the ground state of the exciton, the n equal one in photoluminescence or in absorption, but also to get information on uh, the excited state. And basically here, uh, you have the optical absorption as a function of the energy, uh, very schematics. And a lot of work has been done in many groups to uh, measure uh, the energy position and the characteristics of this exciton excited states up to the free carrier gap. And from this, uh, you can get the binding energy. Uh, of course, uh, if you uh, look at the energy position of the different excited states, n equal one, n equal two, etc., it is a surprising part compared to other semiconductors uh, like quantum well buried in a, 
well-identified uh, barrier material, is that the energy position of the excited state does not follow the classical hydrogenic series, which is driven by the well-known one over our Coulomb potential between the electron and the hole. And the reason is very simple. It tells you that this is the environment. When you deal with the ground state, the uh, average distance, the power radius basically, between the electron hole is of the order of one nanometer. So basically the screening between the electron and the hole will be driven by the dielectric constant of your monolayer. But then when you go to the excited state, n equal two, n equal three, etc., the average distance between the electron hole is larger, which means that you will be much more sensitive to the environment. So overall, the dielectric, effective dielectric constant you have to consider will be smaller, especially if you are in vacuum or in, a, in hair. So basically you can fit uh, the, 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 the dependence of the different excited excit excitant state energy by considering a different dielectric constant. And the key point is to consider this inhomogeneous dielectric environment. So there are different approach uh, from calculation with different potentials. So the one which is more used is ritova Keldish and trying to describe in more detail and not only the very basic one over R Coulomb potential uh, we, we, we are used to. So uh, uh, from this, we can clearly see that the dielectric environment around your 2D uh, layer will play a key role. This is not specific to 2D material. Carbon nanotube, for instance, exciton in semiconductor carbon nanotube, you will face the same uh, 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 the same uh, characteristic of the importance of the dielectric environment on the exciton. So this is clear that initially, as everybody eight, nine years ago, what we did is that we investigate very basic sample, as sketch here, exfoliated monolayer, and just transfer on a silicon oxide, silicon substrate. Turns out that this kind of substrate, silicon oxide is not particularly uh, flat. You have a roughness. Uh, you, have, you may have charge traps in your substrate. And on top of that, the surface is not protected. So you have adsorbed molecules and interaction between the charge around and your exciton in your monolayer. As a consequence, when you, you just have a look to the luminescence intensity or absorption here on WSC2 monolayer, and you identi identify many lines, now we have more or less uh, uh, a, a clear description of the origin of these lines. I will not go into the detail, but this one is a neutral exciton, uh, just one electron hole pair. This one is a charge exciton, trion, two electron, one hole, or two hole, one electron, whatever. But if you look at the line weights in photoluminescence or absorption, it's rather large, uh, at least eight, 10 mini electron volt or even larger. And it's due to the fact that you have this uh, very inhomogeneous uh, dielectric environment. And as uh, many groups, uh, our life really changed uh, when uh, uh, we really progressed on the understanding of the properties when we start to control this dielectric environment. And by encapsulating the monolayer inside a well-controlled uh, uh, dielectric environment, which is here, uh, we, where we use here hexagonal boronitride, it's single crystal, High quality, as almost everybody in the world, we use uh, one from NIMS in, uh, uh, in Tsukuba. It's a single crystal, atomically flat, probably a very low density of defects inside. And on top of that, we protect the surface by this top HPA. And if you put, uh, and so you fabricate this Van der Waals, basic Van der Waals heterostructure, you improve drastically the op optical properties. You have the PL, photoluminescence intensity as a function of energy. You see that now the lines are much narrower, uh, typically between one or two, three uh, milli electron volt. Uh, you can compare with the previous, uh, uh, the same monolayer in the first generation of sample. All the lines are much, much narrower. In fact, this is not true only for uh, uh, WSC2. Basically, you can compare uh, the first generation of sample and the encapsulated ones in HBN for all the, uh, almost all the family, WS2, MOS2, WSC2, MOSC2. This is a photoluminescence intensity as a function of energy, just normalized. And you see the very broad lines at low temperature you get uh, 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 when you are just transferred on silicon oxide and the narrow lines you get when 
uh, you encapsulate. And look, for instance, MOS2 in green, and you have these very broad lines, uh, localized states very broad. When you go into encapsulation, you have a very clean and narrow uh, exciton, uh, exciton line and much lower intensity of the recombination associated to localized or defect state. Uh, it's quite amazing uh, when, uh, uh, like some people, I work and still work on three, five semiconductors, and when the uh, nanostructures are grown by molecular beam epitaxy, ultra vacuum, and you get, for, for instance, 2D exciton line weights of the order of milli electron volt with this, this kind of uh, fabrication technique. Uh, you have a cross section here of uh, indium gallium arsenide quantum well in dark here, uh, four, five nanometer width, uh, uh, thickness. And here uh, you have this basic Van der Waals heterostructure, MYS2 monolayer encapsulated in HBN. Uh, uh, high resolution uh, TM and the, the, the white line correspond to the molybdenum uh, uh, layer and all these lines here correspond to the HBN. And you get uh, a line width of the order of, uh, of milli electron volt, though we have used a very, very basic uh, fabrication technique. Uh, just uh, a recent result we had in collaboration with uh, Stefan Bercio in Strasbourg was uh, to uh, build a basic uh, 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 bilayer, uh, uh, hetero bilayer, where it's made of TMD monolayer and a monolayer of graphene. And uh, here is a, a PL uh, uh, a spectra of all these monolayers, just a TMD encapsulated in HBN with the narrow lines. And we see at lower energy, many lines due to exciton complex, trion, uh, dark exciton, whatever. And you see, when you do, you, you take the same TMD monolayer uh, coupled to a graphene monolayer, everything encapsulated, you get a filtering effect. Basically, you keep only the neutral exciton emission. In fact, you have filtered all the other emissions, the lower energy lines, which correspond to exciton complex or possibly uh, a transition involving recombination with uh, localized states or defects which are usually much long-lived. And so they will be very sensitive, this low energy transition to the tunneling of carriers to graphene. So basically, they, they, they disappear. Whereas you keep your neutral exciton transition, which is a little bit quenched, but not so much at low temperature, because the radiative lifetime, as I will show in a minute, of the neutral exciton at low temperature is very short. And it's competitive with uh, the tunneling time, the transfer time to the graphene. So here you have a, a kind of a, a selective non-radiative transfer to graphene and which can filter your optical, optical spectrum. Of course, so far I've presented results on uh, uh, exfoliated model layer, just mechanical exfoliation transfer. And as uh, you know, of course, many people work on getting much larger area uh, monolayers. And one of the solutions is usually given by CVD monolayers. And for many years, we have, as many groups, we have tr tried to work with CVD monolayers, but with rather disappointing results in terms of uh, photoluminescence or reflectivity uh, uh, characteristics. And for many years, I said that the CVD monolayers are very bad quality, and I was wrong. And as I will show here, again, it was a problem of the dielectric environment. And you can show this here is an optical uh, image of a, a CVD uh, uh, layer. Maybe you can uh, recognize here the classical triangle here of the uh, corresponding to monolayer. So it was grown on silicon oxide silicon. It's a collaboration with the group of uh, uh, Andrei Turchanin in uh, Indiana. And what we have done, so first we have characterized this CVD monolayer. You see, it's the reflectivity, even at low temperature, you have the A and B transition, very broad. Photoluminescence, again, at low temperature, 50 electron volt line widths, very broad again. What we have done is that we have removed this monolayer and transferred it to a targeted substrate, another substrate, where we have uh, already transferred a HBN uh, a layer very flat, very clean. So we have now this MOS2 CVD monolayer on HBN. And on top of that, we protect the MOS2 monolayer by a top HBN. And here, uh, the improvement is spectacular. This is the same monolayer. Look at the line widths of the photoluminescence. It's 5 milli electron volt. 
50 milli electron volt before. So again, uh, it's not as good as exfoliated monolayer, which is shown here, where we can get go down to one milli electron volt or even smaller. But it clearly shows that the key point uh, for CVD monolayers is again the control of the uh, of the dielectric uh, environment. So in fact, all this story can be very well summarized in my point of view from a, 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 a picture I took from this paper from Regan Zoo, Beckley, Stanford, who summarized uh, the, the importance of the dielectric disorder. So here you have a, a simplified picture of your exciton, one exciton, another one, another one. And it's clear that if you have a rough surface, if you have defects on the surface, if you have adsorbates uh, on top of your 2D material, this clearly each exciton will experience a different dielectric environment and you have this uh, strong effect on the dielectric disorder. So the key point is to control this uh, dielectric environment. Uh, HBN encapsulation is clearly a very good, uh, very good way to do this. So now what, again, an uh, important consequence of the fact that uh, when you do optics with this material, uh, basically uh, you deal with exciton. And so the, the lifetime will, give, will be controlled by uh, the recombination of the exciton. So what about the radiative lifetime? And so we have worked on this for many years. And here is a typical experiment from ex uh, where we have done time-resolved photoluminescence uh, spectroscopy with a ultra-fast detector, optimized uh, uh, strike camera, very fast detector. You have the PL intensity as a function of time, picosecond laser, and here you have the decay time of the luminescence, which is typically of the order of one or two picosecond. So initially you could say, well, this decay is just uh, the fact that you create exciton and very quickly they are captured on defect and you just measure the non-radiative recombination. We were not sure of that and now we are really confident that this time uh, corresponds to the radiative recombination for many reasons. The first one, just an indication from the theory, uh, you can estimate the radiative recombination time of your exciton at low temperature when the exciton are in the so-called radiative window. Basically, it scales with the square of the Bohr radius. So uh, one nanometer Bohr radius, you put reasonable parameters and you, go to, you get radiative recombination time at low temperature of the order of uh, one picosecond. And more sophisticated calculation indeed confirms this kind of uh, uh, basic uh, calculation. In fact, uh, now we have a, a further confirmation that indeed the radiative recombination, it was a radiative recombination because uh, uh, we can fabricate uh, uh, Van der Waals heterostructure when we can control this radiative recombination through a Purcell effect. So I don't know if you are familiar with, with this kind of, of effect, I'm well known in uh, atomic physics for, for following uh, uh, the, the pioneer work of Purcell is when we are, you have a, a, an electronic, the spontaneous time of an electronic, excited electronic system depends uh, uh, on the, 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 the fluctuation of the surrounding environment and the quantum field fluctuation. So if you place your emitter close to a mirror or in a cavity, in a weak coupling regime, you can control the spectral density of this fluctuation. And so, Depending on the position of the emitter with respect to your, uh, your mirror, you can either enhance or inhibit the spontaneous time. And indeed, in our case, what is the emitter, what is the mirror in a, in a classical uh, structure I have shown you? Basically, the emitter is a monolayer, which is almost at the top of the structure. The top HBN is very thin. And the mirror, which is a bad mirror, but it reflects some light, is the interface between silicon oxide and silicon. So what we can do is that we can control the distance between the emitter here and the mirror, the bad mirror, but it's a mirror. And depending on this distance, I will show you that we can control uh, the radiative recombination time. And so you can just start by very basic uh, transverse matrix simulation. And uh, you have the uh, showing the fabry piro effect uh, just at the beginning, the wavelengths and the bottom HBN thickness. And this is what we will change in our structure is the bottom HBN thickness. And uh, we measure by AFM the thickness before we fabricate the Van der Waals structure. 
So you see for uh, the emission wavelengths of the monolayer, which is more or less here, uh, with this thickness of HBN, about uh, 180 typically, you will be at the antinode of the optical field intensity, whereas for 250 nanometer, you will be at the node. So here you have a, a view. So changing the optical, uh, the, the bottom HVN thickness, you can vary uh, the, uh, the position of the monolayer with respect to the optical field intensity, either the antinode, either the node. What do you predict? At the antinode, you predict to have a very a fast radiative recombination. At the node, uh, if this puzzle effect uh, is correct, you, it, it appears in this structure, it's correct for sure, uh, you will have longer uh, radiative recombination. And indeed, this is what we have measured recently uh, by measuring for different samples and uh, many series, the radiative recombination time as a function of the bottom HBN thickness and we can vary the time or, or, or on a one order of magnitude, typically between one and 10 picoseconds. So it's basic, mainly the inhibition of the, the radiative recombination time and a little bit enhancement. The enhancement factor is small because we use this very bad mirror, but the effect is here. So again, and so we have now, thanks to the controls dielectric environment, the, 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 the exciton lines are almost governed by the radiative recombination, not fully governed. You still have some inhomogeneous broadening, but uh, you, the, main, uh, the, the main mechanism is the radiative recombination. And in fact, if you want to show this effect, you don't need heavy time resolved equipment. You just need a, a good sample. And here I compare the two samples designed to be either at the antinode or at the node of the optical field intensity. So this is the same structure, you just change the bottom HBN thickness and you measure the, the photoluminescence spectra in CW conditions and you indeed find that the line width of the uh, uh, sample which is at the antinode, fast recombination, so large line width, two milli electron volt compared to the situation where you are at the node. So indeed, and the, the, the lines is not fully controlled by radiative recombination, but radiative recombination is a key ingredient. We are close to the homogeneous broadening of the line. And with this, you can engineer the exciton spectra by the control of the, of the environment. Uh, just to finish uh, this part on monolayers and switching to bilayers, then it becomes a little bit more technical because when we deal with exciton, so far I neglect a very important uh, 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 degree of freedom, uh, essential, uh, which is a spin. How you build your exciton? What is the spin of your electron as a whole which form uh, your exciton? And a lot of work has been done in this field for five or six years and it started with, uh, you know, again, a, a schematic representation of the bond structure. Uh, you have the gap, you have the, it's not at the scale, the spin orbit splitting in the valence bound I already uh, presented between A and B, but also the calculation uh, predict a small spin orbit splitting in the conduction bound, a few tens of milli electron volts. So now when you form your exciton, you have to, two possibilities. Either the uh, uh, exciton is formed uh, with conduction and valence state with the same spin, up, up in red here, or with spin state with opposite spin, down and up. And it can be shown that if you have the same spin, this exciton from symmetry point of view can couple to light, it's a bright exciton. Whereas if you have opposite spin, in principle, I, in principle, you will see why I say in principle, it is spin forbidden, it should be dark, no, no radiative recombination. So for instance, on WAC2, you see that the lowest energy transition you predict in this simple picture is a dark exciton, whereas a bright is at slightly larger energy. So at the beginning, what we did, to, uh, also many groups did this, is to compare just uh, the radiative efficiency as a function of temperature. What do you expect? In WAC2, at low temperature, you expect to populate dark exciton. So you expect, as it is measured here, to have a rather weak luminescence intensity at low temperature. Where you raise the temperature, what we see, surprisingly, compared to many semiconductors, you have more luminescence intensity at room temperature compared at low temperature. And this is 
an indication of this fine structure of the exciton, where uh, at low temperature you populate the dark exciton, at high temperature you start to populate the, the bright and you recover uh, uh, luminescence uh, intensity. Whereas in black, this is the MOSC2, where you expect the reverse behavior, because bright and dark state are expected to be reversed. Uh, and indeed, you find the classical behavior of a semiconductor uh, for many reasons, a larger luminescence intensity at low temperature compared to room temperature. But it turns out that this kind of experiment is difficult to extract really the energy between the bright and dark uh, with, with this kind of approach. And uh, so uh, uh, what we did is we came back more on the symmetry of the system and the symmetry of the wave function. And if you look now a little bit more in detail at uh, the recombination between the conduction state and the valence state, so, so far I told you that what is allowed is a green, uh, represented by the green arrow, which is a bright exciton, which corresponds to in-plane polarized light. Usually when you do an experiment, you do not use this uh, crazy idea to detect by the edge, as I will show now, but what we usually do is we, you excite with a light which propagates perpendicular to the monolayer, which corresponds to an in-plane polarized light. And with in-plane polarized light, considering the symmetry, uh, you can analyze from group theory of the conduction and balance states, indeed, you will have a bright exciton connecting the same spin state from conduction and balance states. But now, if you look at the symmetry of the other transition, the one I called dark previously, it turns out that this transition is allowed not for X polarized light, but it is allowed for Z polarized light, for light which is the electric field of the light is perpendicular to the layer. So in order to measure this, what we did is that we performed this experiment collecting the luminescence by the edge, measuring either the light which is X polarized in plane or Z polarized. And if you measure in green the X polarized, you measure the neutral exciton in photoluminescent spectra, the trion, but almost nothing else. But now if you measure the Z polarized component, you see that a new line clearly appears at low energy, very clear, and this corresponds to this dark exciton. So the dark exciton is not so dark. It is allowed for Z polarized light and due to the spin mixing with um, higher energy bonds, I will not detail. So from this, you can uh, identify where your dark spin forbidden uh, dark exciton, neutral exciton is. You get the splitting between, between the bright and the dark. In fact, as you know, if you look at the literature, uh, very quickly we realize that you don't have to do this complicated experiment to evidence the dark. You just have to use, as most of us do in optical spectroscopy, uh, high numerical aperture objective because the flakes are usually small. We do small spots, so we use high numerical aperture objectives. And because of that, you can collect with this INA objective both in plane light, which is priced in, in the plane, and also Z component. So, with this kind of uh, optical configuration, indeed the dark exciton shows up at low energy. But you can prove that it is a dark exciton if you insert a pinhole and to block the Z polarized component, and indeed, and the dark exciton disappears. So from a, a symmetry of the wave function, we can get information of this uh, optical selection rules and identify the, the dark, the so-called dark exciton, or we call it the gray exciton, because it can recombine. And just uh, before switching to bilayers, a very recent results because for many years uh, we tried and many groups tried, you have many, many calculations in the literature about where is the dark exciton in MOS2. Because so far we had clear uh, fingerprint of the dark exciton in WS2, WSC2, but for molybdenum based monolayers, it was an open question, many uh, controversies about this. So uh, recently we work uh, with our colleague uh, in the high magnetic field lab in Grenoble fabricating very high quality samples, again, uh, encapsulated in HPN, and we use the very classical technique, uh, which has been used for more than 40 years in semiconductors. How can you evidence a dark state if it's dark? Just by applying a magnetic field to mix this state with a bright state. If you mix with a bright state, you will give to the dark state some oscillator strength, 
and hopefully you will start to observe it in an optical uh, spectrum. And indeed, we did this with up, uh, by increasing the in-plane magnetic field up to 30 Tesla. And you have here the magnetic field as a function of energy. The main line is a neutral exciton, X bright here. But you see above 20 Tesla, you clearly see a new line which appears uh, in, the, in this uh, spectra. You clearly see at zero field, you don't have it. And then it tries, it tries, it tries, and it corresponds to the neutral exciton. Uh, to the, the dark spin forbidden dark exciton with a very low uh, oscillator strength. And so we do believe that now we know where the dark exciton is in MOS2. It's 14 mA volt below, below the bright one. This uh, mixing between bright and dark was already performed by many groups on W based monolayers uh, uh, previously. So uh, now uh, I will switch to the final part of my talk where uh, I will present recent results where we try to understand uh, the properties uh, or to get some information, there are still many things to understand, on bilayers. What about the coupling, electronic coupling between bilayers? So in contrast to a very nice work uh, which has been done already, we do not investigate hetero bilayers, uh, where there are fantastic results on Moiré and et cetera, but just to begin uh, in a very modest way to start with homo bilayer, MOS2, and to try to evidence the interlayer exciton, what are the characteristics of this interlayer exciton, and then if we can identify it, can we play with it and engineer uh, and control this, uh, this uh, this uh, interlayer exit. So, as I said in the introduction, uh, MOS2 homo bilayer at the beginning, maybe you can say it's not so interesting. It has been known for a long time that it is an indirect gap semiconductor. So, where basically uh, you have the dispersion curve, energy as a function uh, of the wave vector, and the lowest energy transition occur between a, a valence state in gamma and conduction state either in K or in the intermediate value we can call a Q or lambda. But anyway, this is an indirect transition. But you still have this direct transition at higher energy. And indeed, when you do a, a photoluminescence spectra, which was done uh, now seven, eight years ago on bilayers, uh, this is a curve from the, this paper from Singapore, you can uh, photoluminous intensity as a function of energy. So indeed, you evidence this uh, indirect transition at low energy, but you evidence even in luminescence or in absorption, the transition associated to the uh, K transition, which uh, keeps a strong uh, oscillator strength. Indeed, it's at higher energy. But one of the open question is what about, can we evidence some, uh, coupling between the two layers in the k valley, analyzing uh, this transition uh, occurring in the k valley. So again, in the first generation of sample, uh, we failed to observe this, but thanks to HBN encapsulation and much narrow line widths, I will show you uh, uh, some results. Again, obtain, obtain collaboration uh, for most of the work with Vienna and also in uh, University of Basel, that we can evidence this interlayer exit. So let us start with very basic uh, exfoliated MOS2 or mobile layer. So you use mechanical exfoliation. Statistically, when you have transfer, you have monolayer, bilayer, whatever. And then you encapsulate your uh, bilayer and you do a simple uh, reflectivity contrast ex experiment, differential reflectivity as a function of energy. So for the monolayer, I just recall that we observe, as already presented, the A exciton, the B exciton, here B1S exciton. You can even saw, uh, observe the excited state, 2S, 3S, whatever. When you do this on the bilayer, homo bilayer, exfoliated uh, uh, bilayer, you do observe the A exciton, again, the B exciton, but you clearly see between the A and the B, a rather strong transition, I recall this is a reflectivity, so it corresponds more or less to absorption, which we assign to interlayer exciton, as I will show now. And the surprising point is that 
it has a very rather strong oscillator strength when you compare the oscillator strength here in this very simple experiment compared to the intralayer exciton oscillator strength of the A or B exciton. And indeed, uh, when you perform this experiment as a function of temperature, you clearly see that uh, here it's for monolayer. Again, the A and B exciton, how it uh, changes with temperature from uh, 4K to 300K. And here on the right, the same for the homo bilayer. So at low temperature, I already showed you the A and B exciton. And between this transition, we assign to the interlayer and transition. And when we increase the temperature, you clearly see that you keep this uh, transition even at room temperature. So if it's the interlayer exciton, why it has such a large uh, oscillator strength? So to understand this, uh, we worked uh, a lot with Yann Jaber in our laboratory who performed ab initio calculation. And from this, we get uh, uh, clear information and also some work, uh, again, uh, DFT uh, calculation was also performed by other groups. And it turns out that uh, uh, we have here a schematics of the two layers, uh, the, the layer one, MOS2, the layer two. So clearly, first, you have the intralayer transition, electron hole lying both in each layer. So it corresponds uh, for the A transition to these two, uh, uh, two transitions. But uh, when you do a calculation, so it's basically it's a density functional theory to calculate the bond structure at the GW level, for those who are familiar, and then beta salpeter equation, which allows you to calculate the exciton spectra. So uh, from this, you can uh, deduce the, the imaginary part of the dielectric constant, which, from which you get the more or less the absorption. And you see here, this is this calculation performed for the monolayer. So no surprise, one uh, A exciton, B exciton. And when you do this on bilayer, you find again the B exciton, the A exciton, but in between, you see another transition we assigned, and by analyzing this uh, calculation, to an interlayer transition, uh, which connects uh, a carrier with the same spin. But the key point is that this interlayer transition has a large oscillator strength, thanks uh, to the whole tunneling or hybridization, whatever, uh, of the whole state. You will have a, a hybridization of the whole state, whereas for the electron, uh, the, the, the interlayer coupling for electron due to this dz square orbital it vanishes. Whereas for the whole, it is allowed. And so when we speak about interlayer exciton, in fact, you have to consider that the interlayer exciton has an intralayer component because of this all tunneling or delocalized all. So a good way to, uh, to, to imagine this, uh, to represent this interlayer exciton is represented here, where basically the hole will be delocalized over the two layers, whereas the electron will be localized either on the top layer here or on the down layer here. If you don't apply electric field, anything, these two excitons will have, will have the same energy, but we will see later that by applying electric field in particular, we will be able to lift this degeneracy. And in fact, to uh, get uh, to, to, to confirm this, we tried a little bit to play with the uh, symmetry and the stacking order. So again, not uh, in a very, very uh, fine way as all these uh, Moiré uh, results uh, which are presented in this symposium, but in a very basic way, uh, zero degree between the two layers and 180 degrees. So we basically, you, you, we will compare from an experimental point of view the interlayer exciton with a 2H stacking, the one I already showed, but also the 3R uh, stacking. And if you start from the calculations, and again performed by Jan Gerber, uh, you can compare uh, the atomic arrangement, and which will play a very important role in, in, this, uh, in this story, between the 2H A prime stacking, the, uh, the one and where basically your monolayer, uh, first monolayer is rotated by 180 degrees with respect to the second one, and the three R stacking, where the atomic arrangement uh, will be clearly different uh, in the mobile layer. And the, what the calculation shows uh, uh, 
if you compare these two homo bilayer, in the 2H stacking, again, you see this interlayer exciton between the A and B, but for the uh, 3R stacking, you don't see it. And indeed, now if you enter in the symmetry of uh, 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 the structure and the wave function, you uh, realize that the interlayer coupling of the whole states, which plays a key role in this story, depends on both the symmetry and the atomic arrangement between layers, for sure, and also the spin orbit splitting. I will not comment on the spin orbit splitting, but uh, for sure, in W based uh, bilayer, you expect a weaker interlayer effect uh, compared to MOS2, where, as I said, spin orbit splitting is uh, smaller. But as far as the atomic arrangement between layers, and when you look at the symmetry, you realize that with the 3R stacking, indeed, the whole tunneling is symmetry forbidden. And so because of that, it's not surprising that in sophisticated calculation at the end, you find no interlayer exciton when you have this interlayer stacking. So this is a prediction from uh, calculations. And I will show you now that, in fact, it, it works uh, rather well with experiments. So, how to, can we compare uh, the HOMO bilayer uh, 2H or 3R stacking? You can just start from the, uh, what uh, the nature gives you. If you look at the uh, mineralogy papers, and uh, people who know very well molybdenite uh, from mines, it tells you that in nature, the two polytypes exist, but 80% uh, is 2H polytype but a few percent is indeed 3R, because in terms of energy, uh, people who do calculations, in terms of energy, the two configurations are rather close to each other. So even in nature, you can find stacking, uh, 3R stacking. And what we realize uh, with the, the work performed with uh, a colleague of Siena is that in fact, when you grow uh, balayers uh, uh, with uh, CVD, and indeed, if you look carefully, you will find some of bilayer with 2H stacking and some with 3R, a little bit like uh, uh, you, are, you have in nature. So thanks to that, you can do measurements. And here is an optical contrast, uh, uh, just an optical microscopy image of a CVD grown sample. You recognize the triangle. And some bilayers, you have the, uh, the, the, the 2H stacking, and you clearly see the two triangle with the, the rotation uh, 180 degree rotation. Whereas for 3R stacking, uh, you have parallel, you can uh, check the, ch the, the stacking and the symmetry. And this has been done. We have done second harmonic generation and to check that indeed we have a, a 3R stacking because we have broken inversion symmetry in 3R in contrast to 2H. And here is a result of the optical spectroscopy experiment. First derivative of the reflectivity, differential reflectivity. 2H bilayer, again, as I already showed you, interlayer exciton is there. But for a 3R, it's clearly, uh, it's uh, obviously not present. So in 3R, what you have is only intralayer, whereas in 2H, you have both the interlayer and the intralayer. And in fact, we check this with other way to fabricate the bilayer. One way is a manual assembly of CVD bilayer. So basically, you have different monolayer obtained by CVD, and you just remove one layer, you stack on the other, and you control the angle, 180 degree or zero degree. And so you can fabricate again uh, the two uh, bilayers uh, with the 3R stacking the 2H. And again, you see in 3R bilayer in reflectivity experiment, a exciton, B exciton, nothing between. Whereas for 2H, again, clear uh, signature, clear signal of uh, the interlayer exciton. Uh, another consequence uh, before switching to the uh, control of this interlayer exciton by electric field, if you have coupling, in fact, you expect to have a change of the energy of the valence state because you have this old tunneling. And indeed, if you look at the difference of energy between the A and B exciton in the measurement for the 2H stacking or for the 3R stacking. 
And you clearly see that the full 2 edge stacking depend uh, whatever the way you obtain the, uh, the 2 edge exfoliated as grown CVD or assembled CVD. The splitting between A and B is 30 mA volt typically larger than the splitting you get for uh, 3R stacking. And indeed, this is an ag again, uh, this is consistent with this uh, hybridization or the whole tunneling, uh, which is at the origin of the coupling between the two layers. And you can uh, just quantify this interlayer uh, coupling with a very basic uh, k dot p uh, model at, at the symmetry point k. And from this, uh, you can uh, extract the energy for of the splitting, the, the energy difference of the splitting for 3R. And with this very simple approach, comparing with the splitting with the 2H, you can get, you can quantify a little bit with this very simple approach, the interlayer coupling between your uh, MOS2 uh, uh, monolayers. So it's a way in this very simple system, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to get information on the uh, coupling uh, mechanism. So just to finish now, uh, once we have evidence this interlayer exciton, what we would like is to play with it and to control this interlayer exciton. Because though in monolayers the exciton have uh, fantastic properties, one of the disadvantages is that <coughs> you cannot control them uh, easily with electric field because they don't have out of plane dipole. It's really 2D exciton. So for many uh, uh, experiments we'd like to perform to study exciton, exciton interactions, strong coupling exciton, uh, polariton, it would be nice to have a way to control this exciton, for instance, with an electric field. With monolayer, it does not work, but with this uh, bilayer, Hetero bilayer, it has been shown, but here with this homo layer, I will show you that uh, again we have a very nice way to tune the interlayer exciton state just with electric field. How does it work? Uh, as I said previously, you remember the interlayer exciton is, in our view, is composed of rather delocalized all between the two layers and localized electron either in bottom layer or in top layer. So this means that you expect to have an out of plane dipole. And if you apply a Z electric field, uh, we should be able to control and manipulate the, this uh, interlayer exciton state. And so the motivation are, what about the magnitude of the stack splitting we can get? Uh, we will lift the degeneracy between these two interlayer exciton try to quantify this uh, dipole moment. And also, if we push further the electric field, we would like to see if we can tune in resonance the interlayer exciton in resonance with the intralayer, and then investigate uh, this coupling between intralayer and uh, uh, this exciton-exciton uh, coupling. So uh, this work uh, uh, has been done in uh, collaboration with the group of uh, Richard Warburton in the uh, University of Basel. So basically, uh, you get your, your bilayer encapsulated in HPN, and uh, you fabricate a gated structure, and you will apply a voltage, which will generate a vertical field, EZ field. And then from a differential reflectivity measurement, we will uh, uh, measure how each line, intralayer exciton, interlayer exciton, varies as a function of the electric field. So zero electric field is here. So if you have a cross section here, you recognize the A exciton, the B exciton, and in between the interlayer exciton. Then we apply the Z field, for the A1S exciton, no change, no surprise. It has, it has a very, very, very weak uh, dipole moment, almost zero. So the electric field uh, is, uh, has almost no effect on the A exciton. The B exciton, more or less the same, except at the end, I will, if I have time, I, I will comment. But for the interlayer exciton, as expected, initially I have two degenerate interlayer exciton, one electron at the top, one for the one interlayer exciton, 
the other electron at the bottom for the other interlayer exciton. So if we apply an electric field, it will shift in opposite direction. And indeed, we lift the degeneracy. Interlayer exciton one will go down. Interlayer exciton two will go up. And so <clears throat> we observe the stark splitting. We can uh, just get uh, the energy position as a function of the field and quantify uh, the, the, the stark shift. And you see in moderate electric field, uh, the sh we have a, a, a rather linear shift, which corresponds uh, the maximum is of the order 120 milli electron volts. So it's a strong effect. And we have a significant dipole moment we can uh, easily quantify with this, uh, with this kind of experiment. So here, uh, it's a, again an illustration at zero electric field, you have the A exciton, the interlayer exciton, at uh, 0.5 megavolt per centimeter. You have lifted the degeneracy between the two interlayer exciton, and you really control its, in, its energy state, whereas the A exciton, as expected, uh, that does not move. Uh, uh, do I have uh, two or three more minutes, Antoine? Or uh, if not, I can stop there. But just uh, commenting yeah. on the high field region, as you wish. Okay, I think we have a lot of questions already. So if you can maybe be okay. Quite short so on this. if there's, a, I will skip this part unless you have questions. Uh, when we push the electric field further, where uh, the interlayer exciton uh, will be close to the intralayer exciton, and in that case, uh, we can evidence uh, 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 anti uh, uh, avoided crossing effect. But uh, if you have question, I will detail. But if not, I will go to the most important slide of uh, this talk, of course, is that uh, it, uh, this work has presented has been done by many, many people uh, in Toulouse with very talented postdocs and PhDs, uh, Yoannis Paradisano, Emmanuel Cortard, Bohan, Shivang Ishri, Lai Ren, and for the more senior people, uh, Cédric Robert, Jan Gerber for the calculation I presented, Thierry Amand and uh, Bernard Urbacek. Many collaboration with many groups, uh, Misha Glazov uh, for, uh, many uh, fields I presented as uh, recent results with uh, University of Vienna for CVD and Richard Verbutton for this work on the on the stack shift. So here is a summary. Uh, I don't. I will not spend time. The key uh, words is when you do optics with these uh, monolayers or bilayers. Uh, you do exciton physics. So if we want to understand the optical properties, clearly we we, we should try to get. Uh, more information on the exciton. Now, dielectric environment uh, play a key role. And we can really get uh, improved a lot uh, the, 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 the line widths and then enter a new regime, we, even with uh, some possible uh, quantum electrodynamical effect uh, with these uh, two D layers. As far as interlayer exciton, so it's a homo bilayer, very simple system, but at least with this model system, we could try to get more information on the interlayer coupling mechanisms and the role of the symmetry and in particular the, the stacking order the stacking order sorry so thank you very much for uh, your attention and uh, for sure i will be happy to try to answer your questions thanks a lot xavier it was really a really nice talk and um, and i think uh, everyone uh, enjoyed that um, I do have some question about the anti-crossing between interlayer and intralayer, but uh, let's respect the order. So during the talk, a few people ask questions. So I will first start because it's the first one. Uh, we have a question from Christian um, Novakolsky. Uh, Christian, I think now you can talk. Is it correct? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so uh, we were wondering here why in the experiment with high magnetic field, when you uh, see the dark exciton, in uh, molybdenum disulfide or the disulfide, um, don't you see any effect of Zeeman splitting in 20 Tesla? Yes, for sure. But here we did not resolve the polarization in this experiment. So indeed, of course, you have all the work on uh, Zeeman splitting. But here, it's uh, it's clearly a not polarized experiment where we focus on the just the identification of. Uh, of, uh, of the, the brightening effect, I would say, or how we can give oscillator strength to the dark exciton. Mm. Okay. okay, so you don't see the splitting into two peaks. We, 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 we did not, you know, it's a, it's a, 
specific configuration when we, we did not analyze the, the polarization. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from David Norris. So he put the question there, but I will just ask if he's still around. David, no, I'm here. are you there? I'm yeah. here. So um, I was curious about whether the dark exciton increases the PL lifetime at low temperature like it does in two six quantum dots, or if it just affects the direction of the emission. So if you cool into the lowest state and it's dark, does that affect the lifetime? Yes, so we expect to have this effect, though we have not measured, but because on the 30 Tesla it's not easy. So we have measured the dark exciton lifetime uh, without magnetic field. And the dark exciton lifetime is in the best sample uh, on uh, WAC2 monolayers is of the order of one nanosecond. And basically it corresponds to our estimate of uh, oscillator strength difference between the bright and the dark exciton. So dark exciton oscillator strengths will come from the spin mixing. You know, when I show the spin up, spin down for the state, it neglects the mixing uh, induced by spin orbit with higher energy bounds. And we estimate uh, 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 this mixing to about an oscillator strength uh, with zero field, two or three order of magnitude lower than the bright exciton. And indeed, in time resolved luminescence, we find one nanosecond, whereas for the bright exciton, you have uh, one picosecond. But indeed, if we could perform this experiment uh, 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 in time resolved experiment, in fact, we, we plan to do it not on MOS2, but on MOSC2. Uh, I've not presented, but in the same uh, paper, and also there were nice results in Tallahassee, where the dark exciton has been identified on MOSC2. And on MOSC2, it lies 1.5 millivolt volt just above the bright exciton. So the mixing will be induced, is induced at much weaker magnetic field. And uh, with this, we, with a more standard uh, magneto uh, photoluminescence setup with nine Tesla, where we can do uh, uh, t time resolve measurements. Indeed, we should observe this effect of increase due to the mixing, uh, in increase of lifetime due to the mixing of states. Yes. So there are a lot of questions. So let's, uh, let's move on. Maybe the next question is by Arka Karmaka. Arka, I don't know if you, if you are there. Yeah, hi, I'm yeah. there. Uh, yeah, uh, so I would like to know for the uh, MOS2 homovile layer, you have shown the interlayer exciton energy is higher than the A exciton interlayer energy. Can you please ex explain that in, in the respect of energy diagram or like how is possible? Yes. Uh, yes. So in fact, uh, you have two uh, ingredients to take into account. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, the, uh, the A exciton is this transition. Okay, so the bottom of the conduction band and the top of the valence band. The intervalle exciton, you see, will involve uh, the top of the uh, conduction band and the top of the other valence band in the other valley. And then this mixing with uh, the intravalle exciton. So the, the story is a little bit complicated. So for, at the beginning, you have the spin splitting the conduction band, which is not so, so large. But then the key ingredient is to take into account, we measure exciton. We do not measure a single a transition between single particles. And it turns out that the binding energy from these calculations, and which more or less fits the experimental results, the binding energy of the interlayer exciton is weaker than the binding energy of the uh, uh, intralayer exciton. So uh, when you consider the energy position of the interlayer exciton, we should not take into account only the energy position of the bonds in the single particle picture, but also take into account the difference in binding energy. Okay. Thanks, Xavier. Um, the next question is by Keshav Dani about the dark state. Hi. Yeah. Hi, hi Xavier. So maybe my question is related to one of the earlier questions asked. Uh, so in the MOS2 monolayer, the, the spin dark exciton is 14 milliEV below the bright exciton. Yes, this so, is it. But, 
do, am I just wanted to clarify, I thought that in MO based compounds, the dark spin dark exciton was above the bright exciton. Was yes, higher this, energy. Is, this is what I have said for at least five or six years. <laughs> okay, so you think it's, it, this is a very interesting result then? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, one, uh, when you look at the calculations, it's, uh, you have at least 50% uh, of the calculation which say it's below, 50% of the calculation which say it's above. The prime is not so easy because uh, when you consider uh, uh, what are the key ingredients which govern the, the energy difference between the bright exciton and the dark? You have the spin orbit splitting in the conduction bound in the single particle picture. Most of the calculation, and I, I, I'm, uh, now my vision is here, is of the order of three or four milli electron volts. So basically the two conduction states are almost degenerate. But this is not the end of the story we are not calculating the difference between the single bond, but we have uh, exciton. So the second key ingredient is the exchange interaction. And from the work we did again with Jan Scherber and some measurements we did a few years ago, we estimate that the exchange energy is of the order of 10 milli electron volts. So it pushes down your split, the dark exciton go 10 milli electron volt below, again, due to the exchange interaction between your electron and hole. This is the second ingredient. The third ingredient is the fact that you built your exciton, bright and dark, with two different conduction bounds, spin up and spin down, and those bounds have slightly different masses. If they have slightly different masses, it will give slightly different binding energy, just a first order uh, binding energy. So again, it will shift a little bit in MOS2 the, uh, the, the dark a little further down. So our image with this 14 milli electron volt is that indeed, uh, so it's very difficult to get a, a real measurement for the three contributions. Uh, but uh, probably we are, uh, my feeling is that we are close to degenerate a spin up and spin state in the conduction bound, two, three, four milli electron volt. And then the 14 milli electron volt has the effect of both exchange energy and uh, the, the, the difference of binding energy. And this approach is fully consistent with what we found for WIC2, WS2, and also recently for MYC2, uh, 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 Smirnov measured in Talasi uh, less than one year ago. And in this work, we did it also in MYC2. So we find MYC2 just 1.5 milli electron volt above, though, the spin orbit splitting in the conduction bound is much larger, but then it decreases the splitting between bright and dark with the two other ingredients, uh, 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 conduction bound mass and exchange energy. Thank you, that's, that's very insightful and very helpful. Does it also agree with the picture you showed about the temperature earlier, where as you increase the temperature, the PL of the bright exciton in MOS2 v Very good it? point. And the mistakes probably we did most of us is there is still something which is not clear. Because if you plot the PL intensity as a function of temperature in MOS2, the behavior is uh, similar to MOSC2. It drops. And from this is why all of us said that the dark exciton is probably above in MOS2. So mm -hmm. the open question at the moment is though the dark state is at low energy, why you have this behavior uh, for uh, the temperature? And you, you see, the problem is we believe that the dark exciton has a very, very low, uh, rather low oscillator strength. You need very high field to, to observe it. And even when you observe it, its intensity is much weaker from uh, what we see for WAC2 or WAS2 when we have a brightening, though in both cases, the, the dark exciton is at low energy. So there are it's the, the interpretation is open. There are different reasons. One of them, in contrast to WAC2 and WS2, if you look at the energy difference here, 14 milli electron volt, it's smaller than the uh, low phono energy uh, in MOS2. Whereas in WAC2, WS2, uh, it's larger. So the relaxation to the dark exciton may be is uh, weaker, and this is why you, you have trouble to populate it. 
Another reason is the spin mixing. Molybdenum uh, MO based monolayers, low, lower spin orbit uh, interaction. So the spin mixing, which is a key ingredient uh, to, 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 have, to, to observe uh, a gray exciton, is uh, probably weaker than in W uh, based material. I think we have a very, very last question from Li Shu Wu. Uh, Li Shu, I think you're. Yeah. I, I, okay, uh, many thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, very nice talk. Hello. I have one question regarding the uh, interacetone observed in the photoluminescence spectra. Did you observe the interlayer acetone emission in PO spectra? or only in the reflectivity uh, contrast uh, spectra? Thank you for the question. Indeed, the uh, short answer, only in reflectivity spectra. Why? It's because the MOS2 uh, uh, bilayer is indirect. So the lowest energy transition uh, uh, is the indirect transition. So we, indeed, we do not observe as the interlayer exciton in uh, uh, photoluminescence. We do observe it only in reflectivity. And so thank you for the question because the next target, what we aim to in the future, would be to increase the, um, the electric field so that this interlayer exciton, you see the, the shift is quite significant. It's a, it can be a few tenths, even more. So the idea would be to increase the electric field so that the interlayer exciton becomes a ground state of the exciton. So we would have uh, many advantages. It would be the lowest energy transition, uh, long-lived, uh, out-of-plane dipole. So it could be great to integrate this uh, for a strong coupling or many effects uh, investigating the exciton-exciton uh, interactions. So thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see we're you. running out of time uh, and there are more questions that we won't have time to, to take, but I, I encourage the, the people who had more questions to directly email uh, Xavier. I see uh, Leonardo Campos, uh, Vey, Andrej Gardela, and uh, Sun Feng. I think it's really uh, great that you can maybe take the occasion to talk to Xavier. Uh, but we have to close now this session and let's thank Xavier again for, for this very nice talk. And, Thank you. Uh, Probably I was too long, but sorry if you, uh, please uh, send me an email. I will try to answer you. So by the way, this talk was, uh, was recorded, right? So if you catch it up a bit late, you can always see it again. And we will close that uh, Zoom now and uh, reopen it uh, very soon with the next talk from uh, Paco Guinea. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. We're going to close the meeting now and we're going to start in the next one at uh, 4 30 p.m. Thank you very much, Xavier. See you next one. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.